Well, again, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our virtual innovations and urologic practice program. Um, we really appreciate your participation and I uh, hope you find the program valuable. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, next year, uh, uh, you'll, we'll be able to join you all in, in, uh, in, in Santa Fe. Um, but again, thank you for, uh, for supporting the program. It's really a pleasure for us to have you. Um, so I'm Mike Coburn again. I'm the department chair here at Bailey Urology. And uh, it's my privilege to talk with you today about priapism, a management enigma. Um, I know that this is a challenging entity for, for all of us in many ways. Uh, so I wanna work through a, a guidelines-based approach uh, supplemented by much of my own personal experience. I think we all know uh, the definition of priapism, essentially a condition in which there's penile erection for hours in the absence of stimulation or after sexual stimulation has been completed. And this is uh, an early description uh, from Pompeii. This is a, an entity that's been around and described medically since antiquity. And uh, there have been many changes, obviously, in management over the years. Uh, this is an organizational structure to describe the various types of priapism in terms of presentation and etiologies, uh, ischemic or veno veno occlusive or low flow priapism, non ischemic, uh, where there's unregulated cavernosal arterial flow, that would be a high flow priapism, uh, recurring or stuttering priapism, which is intermittent repeated episodes. And then some people also describe this in terms of primary and secondary, primary being priapism that's due to a, a medical problem or, or a drug use, um, secondary being essentially iatrogenically uh, induced such as through uh, penile injection therapy. We'll talk about the management outcomes and some current directions. Uh, much of my talk, as I mentioned, is based on the AUA guidelines, uh, which were published in uh, 2003 and then verified again in 2010, uh, led by Dr. Montague. Um, and uh, you should be aware that there, there is little prospective management uh, study data in priapism. Much of it is based on case reports, uh, relatively small retrospective series, um, and um, an expert opinion. So the evidence validity level is somewhat limited uh, for this disease process. The range of etiologies and risk factors is really quite broad and really quite interesting. And I'll just go through some of the highlights. Medical diseases, obviously common entities include sickle cell anemia. It's probably the most common etiology in most practice settings. Over 40% will develop priapism at some point in the course of their disease. Uh, hematologic malignancies, other hematologic disorders, uh, sometimes neurologic disease related to spinal cord injury or other uh, um, post-infectious illnesses. Uh, gout, amyloid, infiltrative processes such as penile cancer that gets into the crura, and then a variety of medical uh, medication administration causes, including penile injection, as I mentioned, but uh, antidepressants, uh, the SSRIs, uh, alpha blockers, a uh, variety of antipsychotic and anti-anxiety medicines, and potentially, depending on how you uh, view or believe the literature, PD and PDE5 inhibitors can theoretically be a cause in rare, in rare cases. Other important etiologies uh, would include uh, cocaine, uh, cannabis, uh, methamphetamine, or ecstasy use as illicit drug use, uh, trauma as a very important entity for uh, high flow priapism, spinal cord injury, and, and the, tra the, the trauma could be pelvic, perineal, or penile, anything that could potentially lacerate or tear the cavernosal artery, and then certain toxins, including uh, uh, bites and stings. In terms of evaluation, medical conditions, drug use, trauma, uh, information about duration or recurrence is very important. A very complete uh, examination, including pelvic, perineal, potentially rectal or genital exam. Uh, blood tests, uh, if you're concerned about uh, sickle cell or other uh, hemoglobinopathies, um, a hemoglobin electrophoresis may take a while to come back, so there are some quick sickle tests that are available in most labs, and also toxicology screen, blood, urine, to see if there is a drug use that may, the patient may be reticent to report. Um, the first order of business is to determine whether we're dealing with ischemic or non-ischemic priapism. And blood ga gas testing and potentially a du duplex Doppler ultrasonography can be extremely useful for this. And I've listed here the, uh, the typical blood gas parameters for an ischemic state with a PO2 of less than 30, a PCO2 of greater than 60, and significant acidosis, usually less than 7.2, sometimes even less than seven, depending on how long the blood has been in the penis. Um, Sometimes we'll be looking for sonographic evidence of fistula, pseudoaneurysm, or an infiltrative state, and uh, sonography can be useful for that. And there is some evidence that MRI or MRA can be useful occasionally looking for neoplasm, thrombosis, and occasionally arteriography when we're dealing with non-ischemic priapism. Um, 
Uh, this chart shows some of the key findings and when they're in, in which case ischemic versus non-ischemic, they are either usually present, sometimes present, or seldom present. And certainly you should note that in ischemic priapism, the corpora cavernosa are usually fully rigid with penile pain and the abnormal blood gas, whereas in non-ischemic priapism, often there is no pain uh, and the patient uh, can actually uh, tolerate uh, the tumescence, and usually the tumescence is not fully rigid. And perineal trauma obviously uh, may be an, an etiology by history and non-ischemic priapism. Uh, these are some uh, images from uh, um, uh, the published literature looking at a penile ultrasound on the left, assessing for pseudoaneurysm and infiltrative processes within the corpora. And on the right, a, um, uh, a duplex Doppler study showing a, a, a high flow priapism case where there's an injury to the uh, Cavernosal artery is noted by the arrow. Uh, moving on to treatment. Uh, management uh, of priapism due to intracavernosal injection therapy for erectile dysfunction is something that all of us who deal with ED in our practices need to be able to handle. Um, certainly, it's uh, uh, important to uh, inquire whether the patient departed from their standard dosing, took a significantly greater dose, and also whether they've used any other additional agents that they might not otherwise report. Um, oral medical intervention as an initial effort to try to turn this around is fairly commonly applied uh, with pseudoephedrine uh, or terbutaline. But this, if it's not successful, it's important to proceed promptly to aspiration, injection of phenylephrine, and basically the cascade of interventions for ischemic priapism, uh, because uh, a prolonged uh, uh, priapism episode due to uh, intracavernosal injection therapy can be just as damaging um, in, uh, in patients uh, if, it, if it is not turned around uh, promptly as any other etiology of priapism. Uh, for ischemic priapism, when the underlying medical condition is noted, such as for sickle cell disease or hematologic malignancy, clearly immediate and appropriate specialty consultation for disease management is essential. Uh, bringing the hematologist or the oncologist in to get um, a definitive treatment started, but uh, that is not the, the, the sole form of intervention that should occur. Uh, we need simultaneous direct treatment of the ischemic priapism through uh, intracavernosal intervention. Because ischemic priapism essentially is a compartment syndrome and it's an ischemic state and significant damage to the cavernosal tissues will occur as the time, time passes. Um, for sickle priapism, systemic treatment would include things like uh, exchange transfusion to get the hemoglobin S level down and the hemoglobin A level to appropriate levels, alkalinization, hydration, oxygen, analgesics. Um, and those interventions can result uh, in resolution um, in up to 30 or 37% of cases, uh, but you significantly increase the resolution rate if you also proceed with intracavernosal intervention. So as a stepwise approach, it's important to appreciate what the guidelines say, because I think they, they guide us and also provide some medical legal protection uh, for us as we, um, as we proceed with our, with our algorithm. For ischemic priapism, there's a stepwise uh, process uh, to pursue to try to achieve resolution promptly. And this would be a, a therapeutic aspiration of blood, the, uh, the dark uh, crankcase type material uh, uh, with, with or without irrigation, and then potentially, uh, and in most cases, intracavernous injection of some pathomimetics. Uh, recommendation four from the guidelines indicates that uh, repeated sympathomimetic injections should be performed before moving on to shunting or initiating a surgical intervention. The fact that a patient uh, comes down a little bit with, uh, with uh, phenylephrine injection, but then goes back up, doesn't mean that you go straight to the OR for a shunt. And the guidelines uh, generally suggest that this be uh, repeated um, to really declare that there's been a failure of intracavernosal injection. Uh, you should be aware that there is a, a general uh, trend towards earlier penile implant patient for patients with really prolonged episodes of priapism, such as coming in at greater than 48 hours or for really problematic cases of recurrent or studying priapism. In terms of the aspiration irrigation uh, injection approach, um, the uh, uh, the literature shows a significantly higher resolution following uh, injection of uh, vasoactive agents compared to uh, um, aspiration and irrigation alone, and the risk of 
priapism erectile dysfunction is also lower when sympathomimetic agents are employed. Uh, we generally use a 19 or a 21 gauge butterfly needle in inserted into the corporal base, uh, aspirate 20 or 30 cc's of blood to try to bring about some softening and also decrease the pressure inside the corpora so that you can then facilitate vasoactive medication injection uh, and then either irrigate initially with saline and or start with your vasoactive injection. And phenylephrine has been described in the guidelines as a preferred agent. It's a selective alpha-1 adrenergic agent and has significant significantly less cardiovascular side effects than some of the other um, sympathomimetic agents that have been used uh, historically in the past. Uh, recommendation six uh, just describes the specific dilution and injection technique that the guidelines recommend, essentially with phenylephrine uh, to dilute um, the material with normal saline to a concentration of uh, 100 to 500 micrograms per ml and inject um, in one, mil, one milliliter uh, aliquots uh, every three to five minutes over about an hour. Um, and the maximal recommended dose of phenylephrine during a priapism episode is two milligrams. Um, injecting significantly more than that is riskier in terms of cardiovascular events. And it's also um, uh, probably time to think about some surgical intervention uh, if we've done that on, on more than one occasion um, and we still haven't uh, achieved any D2 mesins. Uh, for patients who have cardiovascular risk factors, um, watching for acute hypertension, headache, reflex bradycardia, tachycardia, palpitations, or cardiac arrhythmia is important, uh, and uh, blood pressure and EKG monitoring may be advisable uh, when you're dealing with patients with cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, and here are some illustrations that describe how this is done. You can spray the skin with a local anesthetic agent. Uh, Here's a needle being placed into the base. I usually use a butterfly. This is a standard needle and syringe. You can see they're aspirating dark blood and then proceeding with injection of uh, a phenylephrine, in this case, achieving nice tumescence. Now, if uh, we have given the uh, vasoactive injection approach uh, a full effort um, and still uh, are, are not uh, able to achieve D2 mesence after a uh, repeated effort to bring, uh, to bring the, uh, the erection down with uh, intracavernosal injection, then it's very important to understand the shunting procedures and how they're done and what the options are. So I think these can be classified in uh, distal shunts, proximal shunts, and um, I think more of historic interest, the, uh, the venous shunts. Distal shunts would include the winter shunt, which is essentially done with a core needle biopsy, like a true cut biopsy that's placed through the glands into the corpora and taking a little piece of tissue out in that way. The Eberhage uh, um, approach uh, with the scalpel blade being passed through the glands into the corpora, and then much more popular now, popularized by, um, by Tom Liu uh, with, uh, with additional maneuvers by uh, Bud Burnett would be the T-shunt, where the blade is placed uh, into the uh, corpora uh, through a small incision in the glands, uh, and then rotated 90 degrees so that you're actually making a little L-shaped incision, and this can be performed bilaterally. Um, and that can be supplemented with this, what's often called the snaking maneuver, where you... And, and, my preference would be in the operating room under some reasonable anesthesia to pass a Hagar dilator down into the proximal corporate to create a channel where um, blood can then be milked out of the penis so that it's not entrapped in the, in the deeper portion of the penis. The algorab shunt is related to uh, uh, the, the uh, ability to excise a small piece of cavernosal um, uh, tunica albuginea through a glands incision. We'll talk more, a little more about that. Proximal shunt would be a quackle shunt, perineal approach. And then historically, the Greyhack shunt, which is really an anastomotic shunt between the saphenous vein and the corpus cavernosum, um, is used very little um, in the current, uh, current era. Uh, this is a, an example of the T shunt, which can be done either with or without uh, Burnett's modification of, uh, of placing uh, the dilator down into the corpora to create space. And essentially, this is a shunt between the corpora cavernosa to the glands and then the urethral corpus spongiosum. And here's our operative pictures showing uh, how we proceed there. Here are the openings in the glands. Um, we've, uh, we've made a T-shunt and, uh, and have already tried to express material um, and uh, without having achieved adequate tumescence, we're now passing uh, the, uh, the cavernosal dilator uh, into the corpus cavernosum, trying to hug 
the lateral uh, posterior wall of the tunica albuginea from inside the corpora, uh, trying to minimize the risk of urethral injury, both distally and proximally. Um, and then this is what it looks like when the dilator is placed all the way down towards the cruce. And then after removing that dilator, you're able to express with massage blood from the proximal penis out through the incision. And then uh, it's only the gland skin, which is then closed after the completion of this procedure so that the shunt theoretically remains open. Uh, this is a, a case that we did um, uh, years ago uh, where we, uh, we had attempted distal shunts uh, um, and then moved on to an Algarab procedure. Now, the Algarab procedure involves an incision that goes across the glands. One of the reasons I don't particularly favor it is that this incision has a tendency to heal with significant scarring um, and often some degree of glands deformity. So I think it's a little bit problematic in my view, but it is on the, on the list of possibilities. And then the quackle shunt, which is the proximal uh, corpus cavernosal to corpus um, uh, spongiosal shunt. Here you can see we're uh, taking a little ellipse out uh, in this diagram from the fascia overlying the, uh, the bulbar urethra, staying very superficial, making sure you don't get down into the urethral lumen. Uh, you know, that's a risk of these shunts. And then doing an actual anastomosis to another comparable incision uh, in the, uh, near the, the, the proximal uh, crural uh, base, and that can be done one side, both sides, uh, and you know you have those options. Shunt complications are not insignificant. Uh, bleeding from the uh, from the wounds is very important to uh, to understand, you know how to ha how to manage that. Um, uh, but it's not unusual to have some additional bleeding outside the wounds after even after you close the glands mucosa. The potential for local infection. I would always use prophylactic antibiotics when performing these shunts because uh, infection and corporitis is a real risk uh, of these approaches. Uh, breakdown of the glands incision with the Algarab, as I've mentioned, the risk of urethral perforation and urethral fistulae is present, but you know generally can be avoided uh, uh, with care to stay more lateral and avoid uh, either the dilator or an incision getting close to the urethra. And there have been cases described of purulent cavernositis after quackles, and there have been cases described of pulmonary embolism with the uh, saphenous vein gray hack shunt, which is one of the reasons why it generally is not used very much. Now, moving on to uh, non-ischemic or high-flow priapism, um, this can result from perineal trauma with laceration of the cavernosal artery, but often there's no identifiable inciting event. And rarely you can have low flow priapism that turns into high flow priapism, probably because of a, a cavernosal artery injury in the course of treatment. Uh, these resolve spontaneously in the majority of cases and ED following these efforts, um, these episodes is quite variable, but generally five to 30%. Um, it's generally frowned upon to use corporal aspiration irrigation or sympathomimetic injection if you know you have high flow because you can be pushing that medication centrally right into the circulation. So it's generally thought to be not effective and there are risks of adverse events. So I, I would avoid those, uh, those maneuvers in true high flow. Uh, most important management is reassurance and observation because with time, most of these events actually will resolve spontaneously. Um, but if the patient is uh, particularly anxious or is insistent upon uh, doing something interventionally, uh, then you really need to have a, a, a well-documented discussion about the, the potential for spontaneous resolution and the risk of these interventions. Um, but certainly there are interventions which are available and selective arterial embolization is one of the important ones. If you are gonna embolize a patient for high flow, Generally, I would talk to the radiologist and make sure they use autologous clot or absorbable gels, which are non-permanent. And the evidence shows that those are less likely to produce persistent and uh, permanent erectile dysfunction than, um, than are uh, the use of, of, of permanent agents um, or sclerosing agents or coils or anything like that. Um, but I would consider surgical management a relatively last uh, um, resort type approach because many of these cases of non-ischemic priapism really will, will do well without those sorts of more aggressive measures. Uh, it's important to be aware of stuttering or recurrent priapism. This can be idiopathic uh, or uh, can have a he hematologic etiology in, uh, in pediatric patients. Um, and the goal is to try to prevent future episodes, obviously, and also treat acute episodes as they occur. Um, and uh, systemic therapies, uh, oral agents, uh, early self-injection, teaching a patient how to inject themselves relatively early um, before they really get a fixed episode. And then the potential for penile prosthesis placement if this is just an uncontrollable problem. Um, but there are systemic therapies that I've listed here that one can consider. Um, and uh, it's important to be aware of what those options are.
Um, so this is an algorithm that came from uh, the guideline. Um, you can see that basically we're starting with history, physical, laboratory studies, uh, blood gas or Doppler ultrasound that leads us either towards the management of the ischemic state or management of the non-ischemic state. And I think it's very important to have in your mind a, um, an algorithm that, uh, that, that, that either, either follows the guidelines uh, because they are as best as we can have uh, evidence-based um, or um, if we really are going to substantially depart from the guidelines, I think as, as in so many other areas of urology, it's valuable to have some documentation uh, of why you chose to depart from the guidelines. They're not laws, they're guidelines, uh, but I think we put ourselves in the safest position by just making a note as to why we feel like we need to diverge from them. Um, so I welcome your questions and it's uh, again, a pleasure to have you all uh, and thank you for your attention.